Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, while avoiding the rest of the news, I saw this story about an incident in a student dorm in Utah which has displaced 22 students living there after one of them started a fire in the kitchen while cooking rocket fuel. Yes, rocket fuel. They were almost certainly cooking up what's known as rocket candy, which can be dangerous stuff, and I'm going to say you shouldn't attempt to make this, especially not indoors, and I think YouTube has actually removed a bunch of videos from people showing how to make it, so again, don't make it on your own. I'm not recommending this. I would really like this video to not be demonetized. Look, I mean, if you really want to use large rocket motors, there's usually safer, legal ways to do this. Like in the US, there's the National Association of Rocketry, and they have a certification program where you go through and you get bigger motors and you show that you have the skills needed to handle these much bigger motors that are properly designed and not going to explode in your face. But some people clearly don't have the patience and rocket candy is made of materials that can be pretty easily bought off the shelf. It's about two thirds sugar and one third potassium nitrate. And you can find sugar in any supermarket. Potassium nitrate is usually found in hardware stores as an agricultural product, although it is getting harder to find. Uh, some places have made it uh, harder to get legally. But you might be surprised to learn that the stuff to make rocket fuel is available like in a regular supermarket. But as it turns out, most of the fuels are actually pretty basic chemicals and you can in fact get them in stores, but not necessarily in a form which is useful to an amateur rocket scientist. Hence my advice about amateur rocketry clubs. But let's start with the original rocket fuel, as used by an all-star cast of historic figures in rocketry. There are Von Braun's V2 rocket used it, Chuck Yeager's Bell X1 in which he broke the speed of sound, and Alan Shepard's Mercury Redstone which sent the first American to space. All of these use good old ethyl alcohol, generally known as, well, alcohol. Yes, most grocery stores will have a large selection of this, manufactured in different ways depending upon your taste and needs. Beer, wine, spirits from all sorts of crops, but the one that is closest to rocket fuel is vodka. It's a simple clean spirit distilled and supposed to be without any flavor other than the alcohol or water. Now most alcohol, so most vodka in the US is about 40% alcohol, but the fuel used in these historic rockets is 75%, which has a lot more kick. This uh, moonshine here has 62% and I don't recommend drinking it straight, especially if you're planning on flying uh, or like a rocket. But if you go to a specialist liquor store, you might be able to find Everclear, which for legal reasons is actually sold as a food additive in the US. Uh, most states will have about 75% concentration, making it as potent as the industrially produced alcohol fuel that was you know, used to launch the first Americans into space. Some uh, states actually allow the 95% Everclear to be sold, but having a higher alcohol concentration doesn't actually help you as much as you would imagine, because increasing the alcohol concentration in the rocket fuel increases the combustion temperature but it also increases the molecular mass of the exhaust since you're replacing water with carbon dioxide, which has a higher molecular mass. So the specific impulse actually only increases by about 5%, and now you have to deal with much higher combustion temperatures, and you also need more liquid oxygen to combust the propellant, which is, again, harder to handle than, say, Everclear. As you can imagine, when these fuels were being stored on military bases, it was common to observe that uh, the alcohol would disappear faster than could be, could be explained by simple evaporation. John D. Clarke, author of Ignition, noted that this rate was even higher when there were sailors in the room. There are all sorts of stories about how authorities tried to prevent the consumption of rocket fuel with various additives, which uh, inevitably led to all sorts of other problems, like people would be getting sick or even going blind as a result of consuming this stuff. And it, eventually, enterprising individuals would figure out how to filter out the bad stuff because it wasn't just grunts. This was a whole bunch of rocket scientists involved who actually understood chemistry and they knew where to get cheap alcohol. Anyway, all of these all alcohol-fueled rockets, uh, they all use liquid oxygen as their oxidizer, which on one hand is technically available in any store. 
and outside any store. In fact, it's just kind of everywhere. I'm breathing it right now. So I guess that sort of counts as being in any store. Getting it in liquid form is a little bit harder. And no, I don't think this alternative liquid oxygen therapy stuff is going to work as a rocket fuel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to help you breathe underwater. Another historically useful rocket propellant is hydrogen peroxide. And you can also buy that in many stores because in low concentrations of a few percent, it's a decent antiseptic. Like dentists used it on my teeth in the past, you know. Um, in higher concentrations, it's used as a bleach. Like you'll regularly see it in chlorine-free bleach products. And in hair dyes, where it can you know, help remove the natural hair color, so that you can replace it with that classic anime pink look. But to use it in a propulsion system, it needs to be very high concentrations, or high test peroxide is what it's called. It's basically in this state, the hydrogen peroxide is just desperate to decompose into hot steam and oxygen given any opportunity. So rockets can use this hot gas directly for propulsion. You know, for example, the Soyuz will use that in the descent system, uh, you know, propulsion system. And, you know, the rocket belts that are used, you know, to fly around, those also use hydrogen peroxide because the exhaust temperature is relatively low and it's non-toxic. Some rockets like the Black Arrow will take those exhausts and then mix those with kerosene and they will get more performance that way. And then you have like the V2 and the R7, the Soyuz, which just use the hot gases from hydrogen peroxide to run the turbo pumps for the engines. So getting high concentrations of peroxide is something that requires special clearances and paperwork for your business case. It is possible to concentrate hydrogen peroxide that you can buy in a store up to the levels needed for rocket fuels. I mean, Peter Beck of Rocket Lab admitted that he did this in his early days of experimenting with rockets. And there is this video by the perennially entertaining Explosions and Fire channel. Don't think that you can just put hydrogen peroxide in a pot and slowly boil off the water, right? What usually happens is you get stronger and stronger hydrogen peroxide until you reach some critical concentration, and then the whole batch will explosively decompose away to nothing. Again, don't try this at home! <laughs> Moving onwards. Uh, ammonia, that is commonly sold as a cleaning product, and like ethanol and hydrogen peroxide, the ammonia we see on store shelves is diluted in water. Pure anhydrous ammonia was used as a rocket fuel on the X-15 hypersonic test plane. But ammonia as a rocket repellent is largely a historical curiosity. It was a stepping stone between alcohol and you know, kerosene. And it's a stepping stone that nobody wanted to stay on for too long because it lacks the performance of kerosene and the safety and party possibilities of ethanol. Anhydrous ammonia is used at large scale around the world. In agriculture, it's injected directly into the soil where it will act as a fertilizer. Okay, moving on. Uh, most rockets I think that we see flying around today use kerosene. And that's actually not something that you'll see in a supermarket. Although I have discovered, by the way, in passing, that the barbecue lighter fluid that is commonly sold is very close to the special jet propellant thermal stability, or JPTS, fuel that's used by the U-2 spy plane. But you can find kerosene at many hardware stores, and I'm sure you can make a rocket engines work with that. You might find that some of the high-performance ones don't handle it so well. RP-1 is a special rocket-grade version of kerosene, which basically removes the impurities to avoid problems with polymerization that can gum up the engine and interfere with the cooling channels. But you know the next generation rockets we're seeing, they're all moving over to methane, and we don't actually need to go to the store for that. Like many houses just have it piped in through the wall to drive their stoves and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, that's great, but the problem again is you need to have it in liquid methane form if you're gonna use it as a rocket fuel. That requires chilling down to cryogenic temperatures, which is uh, not a trivial thing to do. Many stores do, however, sell propane gas uh, in tanks. And, you know, we've never seen an orbital rocket using propane as a fuel. It's one of these things that sort of keeps coming around because on paper, its performance looks better than a lot of others, but it does require higher combustion temperatures. There is one company that's currently working on a propane rocket, and that's at Orbex in Scotland. That has an interesting approach, by the way, because the 
propellant tanks on that rocket are supposed to be concentric. I think the colder liquid oxygen is on the outside, and in the middle tank they put the liquid propane, which is kept close to its freezing point, where the density is highest. Um, okay, how about hydrogen? Okay, we are not going to find hydrogen for sale at your local stores, but since you can make it using electricity and water, I'm sure you can find the stuff that you need to make hydrogen. But then making liquid hydrogen for rocket fuel is an order of magnitude more difficult than making liquid oxygen. Uh, solid rocket motors, uh, actually the main propellant in solid rocket motors is aluminium, right? And you can in fact buy aluminium at any store, like you can buy aluminium foil. But it's a long way from turning that into the kind of fine-grained powder needed to make a solid rocket motor. Not to mention that the oxidizer and the binder needed for these rockets is a lot harder to acquire. There are uh, some of the hypergolic propellants, like nitric acids. Those are actually found in health products. And you'll even find, you know, here's a fun one. Monomethyl hydrazine is actually produced by the human body as it breaks down certain poisonous mushrooms. Yes, Rocket fuels can be life-threatening even if they're not burning you. So anyway, if we go back to the original incident that prom prompted this, there is one important question I know that many of you have and you've commented on by this point, and I don't have an answer to it. Why was there a toilet in the living room? I wish I knew the answer. I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.